Barn and Ingram House. We don't want to know. We're dedicated yes. to our favorite shows. Oh, my circuits. Everybody loves Hippo Toe. Scary Dog. Dancing at Blind Ball. Futurama. Good evening and welcome to TV Party Tonight, where tonight our favorite show is Doom Patrol, brought to you by the good people at DC Universe, DC Comics, Warner Brothers, Greg Berlanti, and uh, Grant Morrison. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm your host, the Mandated Reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And joining me on this epic journey of comic book television phantasmagoria mm. is the one and only Jesse Starcher, the disapproving dad. How do you do, sir? Mm, my goodness. I hear, Hi, you're having, I hear you're having fun tonight. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, uh, luckily, I think that may have, we, we have some of Kira's friends over. Mm -hmm. uh, she's having three friends stay the night, and it's, things may have leveled down to a normal. I feel normal like every night. time your your daughter has friends in the house, one of your child loses the digits. <laughs> yeah, man, that was some shit. <laughs> uh, luckily, Colton forgave Cass for breaking his finger in the door, but he is fine. He is fine now. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting it's been an interesting day. We'll put it that way. Uh, but I am definitely looking forward to talking about one of the surprise hits off of the DC Universe app. Is that what it's called, the DC Universe app? Sure. Yeah, sure. That's what I'll go with. As you can tell, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I was I was borrowing a friend's uh, TV to watch it. How's that? Um, and uh, but yeah, you know, Doom Patrol, man. This is exciting. This is a this was a neat. Neat series that I did not think would have legs under it, and it it fucking took off running. Yeah, this was not something I was really tremendously interested in. In all, in all honesty, it made the schedule because it was a comic book show, and you know the Rattledge and Broadcasting Network tends to try to cover all the comic book shows as many as we can fit into the schedule. You know, like Pennyworth. <laughs> 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 I mean, I might. I, there were some gross parts on Doom Patrol, but I might have to like really hold back from puking watching Pennyworth. You're gonna love Pennyworth, and you're gonna be <laughs> so happy I made you watch it. <laughs> uh, most unexpected hit of the comic book TV season. It's gonna Pennyworth. Be, it's gonna be very punchy. <laughs> At your service. That's right. Um, but enough about Pennyworth. Let's talk about this Doom Patrol. Yeah, I didn't know anything about them. Uh, if you go to the source material Doom Patrol show, Chris Sheehan told you all the things about right. Doom Patrol. When they announced this as a series, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm sure it's one of, like, you know, they can't really do anything with certain properties for DC because they're, say, you know, between the CW shows where they mine a lot of the lesser-known characters and then the DC Cinematic Universe where they're mining the top-tier characters, it doesn't leave a tremendous amount left for this DC streaming universe up. I mean, like, they've got the Teen Titans. That's going into a second season. Uh, Swamp Thing's already been canceled, and the, season, the first season's not over yet, but that was more of an accounting error. Oh, um, they've got Stargirl, which actually made her appearance in a, in a handful of Legends of Tomorrow episodes. Uh, I'm not sure if that's following that iteration or if this is yet another alternate universe. But... Um, so when they, so when Doom, they threw Doom Patrol, which was spinning out of Teen Titans, I was like, nah, it's fine. I'll watch it. I didn't watch it when it was running. I, I, I binged it uh, over the past week, and I fell in love with the show. This this was a sleeper hit for me. Uh, never knew anything about the comic, never read the comic, wasn't really interested in the show outside of covering it for the podcast, and as it turns out, ended up being really, really good. This was one of those deals where... And uh, we'll talk about this also next week when we talk, when we do Cloak and Dagger. Uh, a lot of the reviewers are like, you know, with, with the superhero genre, it feels very limiting. Like, there's only so much you can do with it because a lot of the stuff falls into the broad appeal, broad base uh, category. But as I tell people, from my father-in-law on down, television is where it's at. Television is where you can experiment with 
some really far out there esoteric stuff. And mm. boy, did they ever with Doom Patrol. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Uh, just throwing it back to where you mentioned they had shown up on Titans. I remember when we covered that series, there were two or three elements that came out of that show that I was like, man, I really like those episodes. The Doom Patrol-centered uh, episodes were fun. And also, uh, and, and what was funny was, I remember Sheehan saying that uh, Beast Boy was uh, on one of the teams. I can't remember which, which iteration. I don't know if it was the 80s Doom Patrol in the comic. Um, so, you know, here we got Cyborg, which uh, apparently is totally... Uh, not in line with what the comic book had had brought about. But anyway, back to what I was saying. The Doom Patrol episodes of Titans and the Hawk and Dove episodes of Titans were some of the bright spots of that series. So finding out that the Doom Patrol was going to be spinning out of there, uh, I was like, I, I'm in the same boat as you. No idea about the team. I have no idea as to what to expect. I enjoyed what I saw, but seeing them take that whole team and put a series behind it, I didn't know if it was going to... I really didn't know if it was going to succeed. And, man, oh, man, they really did hit a home run, I think. I mean, this is one of the best ones that I've seen on the network. Granted, I've only seen Titans. Uh, I haven't watched any Swamp Thing yet. I've heard that's decent. But you look at some of the people that run in our circles who have watched this, and they have they said this is this is by far really, really good. So, as of right now... Um... I haven't heard anything about them uh, doing a second season just yet. Uh, we the, the DC we, universe, the DC universe app may not be long for this world. It may that's be, what I was going to say. <laughs> we got to have a platform to put it on first. <laughs> um, I mean, from what I understand, I think a lot. I think a lot of these things are going to be absorbed into HBO Max, which is going to be the Warner Brothers. Uh, streaming service so we might see the things pop up there um, people talked about uh, Swamp Thing also being saved and, and renewed once they figure out the uh, the credit the, the filming credits and all of that um, it'll just get new life on HBO Max or something like that I don't know um, Teen Titans was renewed for a second season and I think that's actually <laughs> unfortunately there was some bad news about that today somebody died while doing a stunt have you heard about this? Yeah, I heard about that. It was the production, yeah, yeah. It was the um, uh, stunt stunt coordinator or production designer or something got yeah. some it was, it, some shrapnel to the head because of a car flip or something. It, it, it sounded pretty sad. So uh, more to come on this Doom Patrol series. They, they certainly left it with the cliffhanger. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. But let's just uh, we don't do these episode by episode. We just kind of talk general themes, performances. Uh, let's take these character by character here. Let's talk about. Diane Guerrero as K Chalice, aka Crazy Jane, aka sixty three other personalities. <laughs> okay, go ahead and name them all off. <laughs> I, I, Be here for the next five minutes. I refuse. Um, <laughs> wow. First of all, do you know who Diane Guerrero was famous for playing? No, I was. I she, was looking her up. What she she is Maritza from Our Orange Is the New Black. I have not seen that show, but that uh, my wife could tell you all about that. She'd recognize her. Yeah, I didn't realize that was her because she, she gives she gives such a great performance in this. I have to say, everybody: uh, Diane Guerrero, April Bowlby, who is uh, Rita Farr, uh, Jovian Wade, who is this iteration of Cyborg, Alan Tudyk, who has a zillion like voice over roles and is plays he plays the villain. The just nobody, yeah. Oh, um, so perfect. Um, Matt Bomber uh, as the negative man, Larry Trainer, and Brendan Fraser really do like this is like some of their best work out of this entire group. I mean, one thing about this show is these are all there's not a neg there's not a bad performance in the bunch. There's no. nobody that kind of took me out of the show. I mean, some people are not particularly wazooey over the CW Arrowverse type shows. They think the acting can be a little too soapish, a little too uh, a little too maudlin. Uh, and this comes, and this is out of, <laughs> this is out of the CW verse mold, minus the restrictions for putting it on uh, network television. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, like saying "fuck" eighty-two times in an oh episode. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Robot Man, Brendan yeah. Fraser's character, and him using the f bomb precisely when I would. <laughs> 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 what the fuck? <laughs> 
but aside from like I said, the overuse of some colorful language uh, and some you know some naughty scenes here and there, the, I, I really thought like of all the the Greg Berlanti shows, this is some of the strongest performances I've seen out of uh, out of what we've seen so far. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I mean, you talk about maybe there. I, I, I could take Robot Man seriously to a point, and and then sometimes it just felt like he was overdoing it. Brendan Fraser was overdoing it. Now, granted, that might be the way he's written. That might be a, a indicative of the character. Without knowing what came before this in the comics, I can't say that it's. It, it may very well possibly be a, a, a representative of what he actually does in the comic always blows things up and that seemed to happen quite a few times blows things out of proportion or at least is befuddled by his own situation most of the time but yeah man i i will tell you that alan tudyk by far is one of the best villains i've ever seen in a dc probably man he's up there and i mean up there with David Tennant when it comes to Purple Man. Welcome so to p- the shit show. <laughs> I mean, oh gosh. So, okay. So we'll, we'll set Alan Tudyk aside. I'm giving him an A plus. All right. Uh, I, I, Timothy Dalton. I wasn't, ta- you know, his, his performance as uh, the chief was great. I really, really liked April Bowlby, Bowlby uh, and her, tr- uh, her performance as Rita Farr. I believed everything that she did. Yeah. Uh, Diane, Diane Guerrero could just, you know, she had all that. She could play with anything. Well, it's so funny that, because she has such a limited role with Maritza. She's a, she's, she's a cutesy inmate in uh, Orange is the New Black. She's part of the, the Hispanic squad of gals. I don't even think she was on the last season. Like, they wrote her character, you know, they, without getting too much into Orange is the New Black, they basically took a good third of the characters and just wrote them off as having gone to another prison and the main cast all went to the max prison uh, that the show takes place in. And, the, and so like, again, she's always been kind of a, she, she's, she's, a, she's a fan favorite, but they didn't, but she wasn't tremendously important to the cast. If I recall mm-hmm. where, and then in this one, She's listed as like, she's the first person listed in the uh, in the credits, and she's phenomenal. Yeah, she's absolutely. I mean, the where she has to go. I mean, granted, a lot of the crazy Jane stuff is her just being very, very direct and blunt and um, vulgar. But where mm. she, but like the the Jane Patrol episode where you go inside her mind, that needs to be nominated for an Emmy. Yeah, you really it, like that one. It's so good. Yeah, and it an exploration of a person who's trying to deal with all these personalities, uh, and of course they have to kind of show how that operates in her head, uh, which is by far extremely interesting. Uh, but the thing that I think two episodes in, I sent you a, an IM. I said, "Man, this is this girl playing Crazy Jane is unreal because she has to switch her." She has to switch her acting almost on a dime I, it, and go from, you know, completely overbearing and obnoxious to uh, a grade A, like, what was the name of I want to call it? It's Hammerhead. Hammerhead. Uh, and then we have when she has to turn into the baby, like the young girl that she represents. I mean, she has to do that in one scene. Yeah, she and she dude, has to one, switch in one dialogue reading. Mm-hmm. Like there and, are scenes of her talking to Niles, uh, Timothy Dalton's character, where she switches personalities three and four times, and and it's not just a change in accent or cadence or speaking style. She has to like do some physical acting as well because a lot of times when yep. these personalities take over, she 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 gives a little wiggle, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the little shimmy. Uh, but no, but I, I, I mean, it's it's just phenomenal, and she really throws herself into the part. I mean, you got to think about it. Just a normal actor trying to do that and pulling it off and making it believable. That's the tricky part, is mm-hmm. to make it believable, to make you believe that this person has 64 personalities in their head and that each one of them has different, you know, different reaction to the world that's going on around them. It's... 
it, it is phenomenal just to even try to comprehend what she's doing. Uh, so ha my hat's off because that was a very, very good, uh, a very good piece of acting all throughout the series too. I mean, that was 15 episodes, by the way, I was expecting 10. I was mm -hmm. like, I can breeze through this in a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark's like, no, it's 15. I'm like, oh, shit. And I will I'll... tell you, I was not looking forward to having 15 episodes of this, but this is one of the rare exceptions where I'm going to say, you know what, 15 episodes, it, it needed it. When, like, yeah, when have we said that a, uh, that a comic book show needed the 15? Uh, are Flash and Arrow pulling 20s? Is that what they usually do on CW? Yeah, like but there's a lot of breaks. And unless, unless you're... Like, like, I'm watching Black Lightning right now, but that's only, like, 15 or 16 episodes. Yeah. And a lot of times with the Marvel stuff, we're sitting there saying, okay, this could have been 10. Yeah. Uh, but 15 was fine. I didn't have any problem with it. Yeah. Um, I thought for, you know, for a show meant for binging, 15 might have been too much. You know, it really needs to be 10 before, you, you know, before it just feels like some of these are filler episodes. But I really feel like his episodic sort of chapter storybook telling for a TV show, I thought it needed the time to percolate. This is mm -hmm. a weird fucking show. Oh, man, is it... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so fucking weird. It's very meta. Um, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking. There's a oh, lot dude. of relationships. It's very dialogue heavy. But you need time with these characters because... Like and, and I want to get to him momentarily, but I tell you what, my let let this is a good transition point to talk about the next character, Rita Farr. Rita Haywood gave good face. Rita Farr, alas, the woman, alas, the girl, played by April Bowlby, who, according to her wiki, uh, was known for playing Candy on Two and a Half Men, and Stacy Barrett on Drop Dead Diva. None of which I've watched before, so I have no idea who this woman came from, but she gives a spot-on performance of a 50s actress to the point where I actually thought they plucked her out of the 50s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, they she... got in the time machine. They were like, hey, you, c c come here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she did a great job. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the great moments that I remember from... Um, I'm remembering at the end where she had to deal with trying to teach a bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I, this was towards the end of the series where she's actually... Uh, trying to teach a lot of kids how to act, and like, an adolescent girl her. told me to fuck my face and die <laughs> with a weed whacker. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's so uh, brilliant about her performance, her reading of, of Rita, is that she has the haughtiness of a Hollywood actress of the fifties, but it comes very naturally to. To the point where, like, where she's bonding with Brendan Fraser's Robot Man, or she's bonding with Cyborg, and you get that there's a real person in there struggling mm -hmm. to figure out who she is because she's had to play this actress for so long. You know, that, that's part of her origin is that you know her parents kind of she, she was a child star. Her parents kind of shoved her out there early, and they buried her true person, who true person, so that she could be the successful actress. And she's now, you know, and then since the, you know, she, she got the elasticity powers, she's been sort of just struggling with, if I'm not an actress, what am I? Who was I even before all of this? I, you know, like, you, you know, your personality doesn't harden as a child until, uh, you know, you're a couple of years in. And I think at the time that she did this, you're led to believe that she's been, she's been doing the acting thing for a little while, even before you, you meet her in the show as a child. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say... You know, and, and, and I think April Bowlby does a really good job of portraying this character really struggling with her identity, her sense of self. Yeah. The other thing that I picked out of this, uh, and this goes pretty much for the whole team, but really for Rita herself, uh, the fact that she, you know, didn't want, didn't believe in being a team uh, and, and being successful as a team member of the Doom Patrol, which really, you know, it's funny that they call this the Doom Patrol when you find out, like, halfway through the season, there's a whole other team called the Doom Patrol. But, again, this fucking se this series is weird. Uh, it, <laughs> but, you know, she, I think at one point, Cyborg's, like, just giving up on her. And it's like, we know you don't, it seems like she's doing anything 
and, and everything to not become involved with whatever missions uh, that that they're going out to try in, in order to find the chief or whatever. But that's something uh, to talk about right there because you because here's the thing: when the Fantastic Four went into space and got uh, exposed to cosmic rays and got their powers, the thing was the one that was like, "My powers are a curse. I'm mm-hmm. a rock. I'm a rock lobster. I'm a rock monster." <laughs> Um, <laughs> rock monster. Grab, grab the Guitar Hero controller right now. <laughs> um, you know, but like you know, human, like they all, except for maybe the Invisible Girl, because you know, um, you know, comics are, are for boys and we hate girls, right? Uh, she was the only one who had struggled with her powers and trying to, you know, it took it took it took Sue Storm like just years to master those powers. Yeah. Um, and, and realize she's like the most powerful one of the bunch. Yeah. But like you think about Reed Richards, who instantly knows how to keep himself solid and can mast and has mastery over his elasticity instantaneously. She gets exposed to this like toxic mist, and her her control over her elasticity is directly related to her anxiety and her emotional state. Yeah. And she has zero she has no control over it. Like she has to like meditate and and breathe and she has to use a mantra uh, the person who's breathing is me in order to calm herself down in order to like you don't see her really using her powers her to her the time spent with the chief was just hiding from the world yeah so she's, the, she's very vain she doesn't want people to see her i mean obviously it's pretty traumatic when she dove into the water or fell into the water comes back up and her skin's hanging off of her face right. this beautiful actress has now lost a career uh, and as you know, uh, uh, crippled socially, pretty right. much. But that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, if you think about some of the other characters that are portrayed in TVs and movies, t- TVs and movies. I'm pluralizing TVs. a lot these days. I'm very tired. Yeah, um, TVs. <laughs> call Moffat. I'm being neurotoxic. Um, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, think about the along. I don't know. You don't watch the Flash, but the elongated man. He kind I know, of uh, Ralph Dibney, right? Yeah, he kind of instantly knew how to use his powers too. Once he was exposed to them, um, what he learned throughout the, the last two seasons was how to do interesting things with them. Like mm-hmm. basically, uh, he he learns early on that he can change his body shape. So when we meet him, he's a fat schlub. But then he's like, "Oh, I have elasticity powers now." And they're like, "Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you focus, you can change your body shape." And he fashions himself into a in shape skinny Ralph Dibney. Um mm-hmm. and later on in the show that you know they show him changing identities altogether. So he's not just stretching or changing shape or flattening out. He's actually like he's imitated the flash a couple of times to throw mm-hmm. people off that scent. Or you know, or he's infiltrated people by becoming a bad guy or whatever. Um, so there's an so there's an example of yet another character who isn't having the problem Rita's having. Rita's never shown any of those things, so she yep. just feels like like she's just a monster. Like basically, this isn't so much a person with elasticity powers so much as she's a werewolf. Yeah, and you don't really see her use her powers until. I don't know, I think it's halfway through the season where she finally figures out... I was going to say Cyborg Patrol is the only time I've ever seen her actively use her powers for anything. And that's the most hilarious scene ever. Is that... Okay, I'm trying to think of the one. Is that where she... She has a... She's hiding I, inside Robot Man. Okay. And and then... I, I'm, go ahead. I was going to say, the one I'm thinking of is where they were protecting that kid from the cult. And... Uh, something comes after them. It's like one of those uh, <laughs> the straight razor nuns. I can't remember what they are, but anyway, she grabs one of them and shoves them up with her arm mm-hmm. uh, yeah. against the wall. Yeah, and, she, and she stretched that's her the arm first time, I think. Yeah. yeah, she she does that one time, and and that and that's actually I think the turning point where she starts to realize, okay, I can be a member of this team and I can right. do things to help out. I can control myself and actually use these powers for good. And also, she's invested in trying to save that boy. I mean, right. she was really invested in. in um, but yeah, you, I, so that's halfway through the season. The rest of it, I mean, she's she's barely keeping herself intact. She becomes a full yeah. on blob at the end of episode one. And she can't control <laughs> herself. Right. Um, she's you know in a flashback, she turns into a blob and smothers a producer who was trying to get <laughs> naughty with her. Um, 
but I the 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 reference that I'm making to Cyborg Patrol is the in the way to get Cyborg out and you know and how they're going to infiltrate. Oh the, yes, uh, not the ASA. I the ASA is Black mm. Lightning. Um, the Department of Normalcy. Yes, Department of Normalcy. The Ant Farm. That's what it's called. Um, mm-hmm. The way they're going to infiltrate the Ant Farm is they're going to have Robot Man get caught. And then she's hiding inside Robot Man. And as she's oozing out of him, she's like, oh, oh, God. Oh, you smell. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she did a great job. Uh, yeah. This. Uh, oh, my goodness. I had her name here. What was it again? April. Um, Ape, April. Yeah. And what, what, what else has she been in? Uh, because. Like I said, two and a half men and drop dead diva. Okay. All right. Well. Yes. That's, did... what the, that's what the link the quick link on it. I'm actually going to go to her Wikipedia page and see what else she's been in. Cause she, like I said, she's fucking phenomenal. Um, yeah. Two and a half men was, yeah. Just like you said, drop that diva 78 episodes. The rest a, of them are all bit parts. It looks like she has a lot of, um, a lot of television credits. So she's, uh, she, um, she, she was in two episodes of Heather's in 2018. Mm-hmm. She was four episodes a, of how I met your mother. Do you remember that at all? She was Meg. Oh, okay. Uh, she was in one episode of The Big Bang Theory. She was in an episode of You're the Worst. She was in an episode of Mom, an episode of Psych, an episode of CSI. She was um, a main. She was a main character in Drop Dead Diva, as I said before. Um, she was in seventeen episodes. She was a, a main role and a recurring role. In, main role in season four, recurring role in season three. Guest star in seasons ten and twelve of Two and a Half Men. Men. Men 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 men, 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 manly men. Um, as far as her film roles, she doesn't have a lot here. She's got no. nothing I've heard of. Unbroken Path to Redemption in 2018. Seven years before that, from Prada to Nada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2009, The Slam and Salmon. We, it's a we restaurant, have, isn't it? We need to have a conversation about that. All and right. And 2008, All Roads Lead Home. Okay. So, yeah, she's mostly a television actress, it looks like. All right. I'm just flipping through some of the uh, TV time stuff. And uh, I know I want to mention this right now before I forget, okay? This is probably one of the most faithful shows to the source material that I know. Uh, There are a lot of liberties taken with other shows like The Flash, Arrow, But if you look at... Now, granted, I haven't read a whole lot, but I can tell you that just going through some of the stills, people were comparing it to actual comic book stuff that was coming out in the 60s, 70s, or whatever from Doom Patrol. Uh, Animal... What was his name? Vegetable Mineral... Animal uh, Vegetable vegetable Mineral Man. (laughs) Dude existed in the comics. And this is a 12-cent comic. August... uh, uh, Let's see. This is the Doom Patrol number 89... Uh, so, and that's how wacky. If you look at that dude on screen and you compare it to the comic, you would have never thought in a million years that they would do something like that and put it on, uh, put it on TV. Well, that was one of the funniest things about the Batman Lego Movie was the references to like the fourth and fifth tier obscure Batman villains, and they were all real. Uh, see, <laughs> and, and that's know, beautiful. The Condiment Man. <laughs> <laughs> An animal vegetable mineral man, okay, he shows up for one episode, has a pretty, you know, pretty good little, you see him normal and then you see him turn, but he never shows up physically, I don't think, for the rest of the series. Yeah. However, when the TV's on, <laughs> animal vegetable mineral man has got into some hijinks again. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's always in the background when the news is on. And I like the fact that his head's like, his, his dinosaur head keeps biting his real head. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Oh, it's great stuff. So, yes, so one of the highlights weird. of this show, and because I wasn't wazooey about her when she was just knitting all the time, and she was very much the I don't want to get involved character. But as as things start to progress, as the as the you know the the thread that sort of moves the plot forward is that uh, Mister Nobody kidnaps um, the chief Niles Calder, and so they're all kind of committed to bringing him back because. He's like the one person who they believe at the time was there for them when they turned into hideous monsters. So she, so she kind of 
gets on board out of necessity, but then things keep happening, like the kid that they save from the cult. You know, um, the... Uh, I don't think she gets involved with Danny the Street, which we'll talk about, which is your favorite character, apparently. <laughs> oh, jeez. <geez. laughs> so abstract, man. I'm telling uh, you. But, I, but she, she, uh, she ends up... There's an episode where she, like I said, where she bonds with Robot Man, where they, where you know, where he goes to his um, racing coach's funeral and tries to meet his daughter. There's, oh, yeah. there's the episode where, excuse me, her and Cyborg kind of bond. She has kind yeah, of yeah, they off, needed to. She has kind of an off again, on again thing with with Larry, who kind of takes over the role of I don't want to get involved in anything ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he, I was going to say if there's another person that's guilty of that it's definitely larry trainer he is now rita will kind of be like oh whatever uh sure whatever you know but larry's like what the fuck i'm not even becoming i'm not even tr- attempting to right. do anything you know he's he's more on the nose about it so um I, I can't say enough good things about april bulby as rita Farr. i liked her arc in this whereas i think diane Guer- guerrero gives a more dynamic performance um, mm-hmm. re- April Bowlby gives a solid performance and is very engaging to me and has a very interesting arc throughout this. Like Diane Guerrero, I think I think her character is Crazy Jane. I don't know as mu- has as much of an arc per se as she is just kind of a dynamic character that that really propels the plot in a lot of different directions due to the actions, the decisions that she takes. Mm-hmm. I will agree with you 100%. Um, Jovi and Wade is a much better cyborg than whatever fuckface played him in the Justice League movie. <laughs> you know, I still have not watched the Justice League movie. You ain't missed I have, shit. I, ain't, I haven't watched Aquaman. I haven't watched the Justice League movie. Uh, man, I, I just have no desire for some reason. Uh, the and Aquaman movie is worth a watch. I heard that that's pretty good. It's, you know, hearing the stuff about cyborg uh, in the Justice League movie and just how I'm glad that Jovi and Wade is doing a decent job with him here. He, I um, think he does. I, th- I think Jovi and Wade, you know, playing him as another character struggling with his identity, you know, he's sort of been given this cyborg identity and he's adjusting to it, but there's all of this self-doubt and self-loathing. Um, you know, there's guilt over him having killed his mother, the mistrust of his dad. You know that you know he feels like his dad is manipulating him. Um, there's there, there's this man versus machine inner yeah. turmoil he's got going on. He's, he's real... got to deal with that, he's and I think deal with the fact that he's potentially turning into a, a machine. Right, and I think Jovi and Wade did a really really good job of making a thoroughly uninteresting character really interesting. I agree. I, I didn't understand. I was right there with Sheehan. Why the hell is Cyborg with this team? Uh, and like I said on source material, I was like, they had to have just said, okay, well, we need... He isn't in Titans, so we need to throw him somewhere. He is a member of the Justice League, for shit's sake, so we got to have him on some show. Uh, so they put him with Doom Patrol. And then well, I was like, why? I, I think they looked... like I said, I made a crack on source material. They looked at all the black characters in the DC universe. Like, well, we've already got... Well, Black Lightning's already got his own show. So, mm-hmm. fuck, who's left? Um, <laughs> but I think also they knew Doom Patrol, based on its name, was only going to get a very small niche of comic book... Like, not everybody that reads comic books watches the comic book shows. We know plenty of guys that are like, all the shows stink... Yep, and I'm and I won't watch any of them, and I'm not spending the extra money to pay for DC Universe, but read comic books. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I think this was an uphill struggle, and I think uh, I don't. I feel like in the original pitch, Cyborg wasn't in this, and they were like, "We need a, we need one of the main Justice League characters to be in this as a hook. We need a popular character yeah. to hook the casual hook people." Because they're not going to know what a fuck a Doom Patrol is. And they were like, well, we can't use Superman or Supergirl. We can't use The Flash. We can't use Batman. We can't use Wonder Woman. We can't use Aquaman. Who the fuck is left? Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, and I think they landed on Cyborg. One, because he was easy to do on TV with minimal special effects. And two, I thought his addition to the team 
um, you know, as somebody who's a known hero and a halfway competent hero dealing with this group of monsters and werewolves and fuck ups, uh, was a nice contrast. Yeah. Because as, you know, they're, as they're evolving and elevating, he's descending into madness. And that's interesting. That's a, because he seems like one of the most grounded characters that when he shows up, because he's been doing his own vigilante type justice on the streets of Detroit, was it? Yes. Um, and so he and his he is aspiring. That was what was <laughs> what was neat was he was aspiring to become a part of the Justice League. And and uh, Robot Man would just keep continually giving him shit about that, which was hilarious. Yeah. Uh, but. You know, he seemed like one of the most grounded characters, and when he comes in, it's almost like he's the natural leader of the Doom Patrol. Uh, and then, as the series progresses, as the season goes on, you know, he's just like you said, fighting that war within himself. Doesn't trust his own dad. Near the end of this, near close to the end of the season, there's a point where he almost kills his own dad, uh, and it's you could see him trying to just trying to keep a, a hand on reality number one, let alone be the leader that he's supposed to be. Uh, so, you know, I liked, I, I really liked his addition to it. I didn't think it took away from it. I didn't think it took me out of it in any way. All my worry about why in the hell is he with the Doom Patrol, it it went away. It felt natural. I, I think they did a great job of, if they're shooting hoarding him in here, it was a really loose shoe. I, um, I was really... I'm gonna say, yeah, I wasn't particularly excited to see him in this, but because uh, I don't think Cyborg's a very interesting character to begin with, and he was done a huge disservice in Justice League. Uh, he really shines here. The, the kid that plays him, um, uh, Jovian Wade, who I think it's Joy. I think it's Joy Vaughn. Joy Vaughn J-O- Wade. Joy J O I V A N. Okay, so he first appeared in the BBC comedy Big School. Uh, he starred in the teen drama Youngers. Um, he has a YouTube show called Mandem on the Wall, and he was in two episodes of Doctor Who. Terrific. All well, right. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I really enjoyed him in this, and I thought his his addition to the cast uh, was was essential. You know, after yeah, the fact. and they they kind of built a plot around him too, where supposedly uh, Crazy Jane had a vision of mm-hmm. him, you know, killing the Doom Patrol or the Doom Patrol strewn about him. It was a painting and stuff like that. So you're wondering, is he going to turn? And of course they thread that along too as well. Yeah. Is, he, is he going to be the one that turns on everybody? Um, so let's talk about the negative man. Right. Larry Trainer is played by Matt Bomber who um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Bomber voices the character and appears as Trainer in flashback but uh, the body double is played by Matthew Zuck. Okay, and I, and I have to say, Matthew Zuck does a great job of emoting through the bandages. Yeah, I mean, well, we have two actors here that do not have facial expressions. Uh, Brendan Fraser, you can't see his face move at mm-hmm. all. I mean, his jaw doesn't even move. I think at one, maybe one or two spots where they open his jaw, but it's not like his mouth even moves. Uh, and <laughs> this guy, Larry Trainer, is completely wrapped up in bandages at least 90% of the show. Um, every once in a while, he takes it off. You get this scary-looking Deadpool guy underneath because he's been horrifically burned. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if there is anything that maybe took me out a little bit was the fact that you could just, you could really tell the dubbing sometimes. Like, okay, well, you know, he's... It almost felt like his voice was disembodied. It wasn't natural, and I understand that's it, they have to do something there with uh, its TV for Pete's sake. They've got to at least make it sound. But again, I still follow the arc. I was still invested in Larry Trainer and his. Uh, oh boy, his story! It was yeah. it was kind of tragic. I have to say, his story was probably the least interesting to me until he started to try to figure out that the negative energy in him. Uh, was not a curse, and that's kind. Of, that was a thread through all of these characters: is that the these in, these situations that they're in were not and the curses. powers are given, right? Were not curses, but blessings. If they knew, if, if they would just just accept them, everyone everyone's got kind of a Hulk thing going on. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this monster inside of me, and I have to learn to live with it, or neither one of us is going to be successful here. 
Um, but yeah, but but he he took some doing getting used to. Now the subplot of him, you know, dealing de- being a closeted homosexual in what was the, another one in the forties or fifties, um, you know, and him sort of struggling with still being a closeted homosexual in twenty twenty, you know, twenty nineteen. Yeah, I'll tell which you, by the way, the, all these characters are almost immortal. I mean, they have yeah. to be. Well, that was a plot point. Was Niles Calder was lo- was looking for the secret? To, was looking for the Fountain of Youth, and as we learn in the very last episode, he was looking for the Fountain of Youth for his daughter. Oh, okay, all right. Which, by the way, did they show her face? No, not that I could they see. Did, they did not show the daughter's face. Do you remember what she and said she looked like? She looked like an ape. And if yeah, you remember was... in the flashback, he's he's banging that like cave cave woman. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh man. All right, go ahead. I was, interrupted you. He was getting himself some jungle boogie. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, he he he's probably the character I like the least, but that doesn't mean I didn't like him at all. And I and I actually have to say, I really appreciated the episode where he finally goes to see his ex lover, um, who's like on his deathbed. Yeah. And they and they have a reunion and he's like, Yeah, I, I just you know, I got over you. I, I wish you could have accepted and and they have like a series of fla- of they're not flashbacks as such, they are uh, corrupted memories. You know, where he's like, Can't why can't you just be with me? And there's this conflict over, you know, Larry wants to be with him but in private, you know, behind behind a door that says beware of the leopard. Um, you know, whereas he wants to be out, you know, he wants to be like there there there's this debate over how you should handle yourself as a homosexual and but it's being had by people who grew up in a time where you could be killed for being a homosexual in this country yeah yeah i i'm trying to think really if i I mean it was it was it was it was told great i mean that was fine i i had a fine time watching that and watching him grow i mean when he makes his way to danny the street it almost looks like he's uh finally going to come out and which i think he does i but, love uh, the danny the street episode only because of the song he performs <laughs> yeah <laughs> which was the opener to our uh to our uh source yep. material episode was it like but, we're all weirdos or something like that mm-hmm, yeah and you know he's you got to think about this character this guy who wraps himself in bandages obviously because he think he thinks and probably yeah He's pretty gross on the inside of those bandages. When you look right. at him, he's he's horrible. But it's also a very good allegory for what he feels himself. I think as well. Yeah, it's it's, uh, symb- it's it's symbolism for people feeling like being a homosexual or transgendered makes them a monster. Yeah, and and that's you know, if anything, I think that's told pretty well in my opinion. But uh, I mean, you have his negative being power or whatever is I can't even remember what they called him uh, I think Flex Mentalo was calling him Sparky at one time <laughs> but <laughs> I can't remember what the thing's name is uh, but anyway you know that right there seemed like the most powerful person on the group at one point I mean that thing could fly through walls and zap people and was laying people out left and right mm-hmm. uh, but you know again this is a character that's at war, that's at war with the the other side of themselves. So Larry mm-hmm. Trainer and this negative entity are tied together and they have to work on coming to some agreement to where they can question. Do you think this, do you think the show is gay positive? Like do you think it's like, like a progressive show for people, you know, in the LGBTQ community? Like would you recommend this as a show like the you know people who are accepting of comic book shows would enjoy? I guess. I mean I I would assume the story that was being told there was probably would resonate. What's that? Would resonate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it would be something that would probably resonate with some people. If I can see it, I'm sure that somebody has had to go through that. Probably could see that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, um, I, I wonder. I, I would like to because I think I think anybody can appreciate this show if you're willing to sort of you know put the fact that it's a it's a weird comic book show in the back of your mind and just sort of focus on the story being told, a very complex story being told. And a lot of the meta humor and fourth wall breaking that goes on, but I, you know, but there's there is a part of me that would just that that wonders like if you're a, if you're a gay uh, tr- or trans person, 
is this the kind of show you want to watch? Do you want to continue to see people tell stories about struggling with that part of your sexuality, that part of your identity? Or are you just kind of past it? Like, can we tell a different story? Can there be another narrative for gay people besides we're all struggling with our sexuality? Just just, just throwing that out there. I, I hear you. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't really comment as to whether it's... No, speak for would... gay people, Jesse. <laughs> It's kind of kind of impossible for me to do. I well, I could I could definitely say one thing. This isn't this doesn't to me seem like it's portraying them in a negative uh, light in any way. It's any you could say it's for gay, trans, whatever anybody that's dealing with an issue that they're trying to hide. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I, but you know, Larry Trainer just happens to be gay, and that's what he's that's what he's going through. So, I, I mean, I. Is it a good representation of somebody struggle through it? In my opinion, yes. So, speaking of struggling with uh, with with things, you have Brendan Fraser, who look has not chosen a <laughs> lot of great roles. Okay, Brendan <laughs> Fraser, Encino Man. <laughs> yeah, Brendan Fraser, his uh, his filmography is spotty at best, and I Early thought to he, the center of the earth. I of thought course. he was really brilliant in this. Uh, I, I I I will agree. I enjoyed his portrayal of Robot Man. Um, I enjoyed the everyday, like, holy shit, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, what the fuck? Which was repeated ad nauseum. What? At one point, at, at one point, I think at the end of episode one or the beginning of episode two, where he's just yelling what the fuck over and over <laughs> when that town sinks into the black hole. <laughs> yeah, when it goes up the donkey's ass. Um, <laughs> what, what cracks me up about him and, and, and about this show is how much bravery it takes in telling weird stories in the sense of like your point of view character is a guy whose brain was transplanted into a shitty robot. Yes. Yes. We're all robot man in this show. We are. We really are. We are being represented by a brain in a robot suit. Uh, and you know, it's, it's perfect. Because every, any time that he said that, uh, that would have been exactly the same time I said it. Because mm-hmm. it, it's just too much going on that you cannot even wrap your head around. And just imagine that being your reality. So, like, whenever I'm telling somebody who is out of the loop on whatever thing I'm referencing, I always... Like, I'll, I'll give this, this is a kind of a good example of this. When I was... Talking about getting a Green Lantern tattoo, if I can make it five years without a cancer uh, reemergence, you know, uh, because green is the color of will, and I had the will to survive, and that was the connection for me. I remember, I I think I told you the story. I was explaining it to one of my wife's friends who doesn't read comic books and thinks they're for children. And by the end of the explanation, I felt like a loser. (laughs) She's like, Why are you getting that tattoo? Oh, okay. Because, right. like, they, they don't get it, and they're not making the connections. And, you know, and it's so funny, because I look, I look at this series, and this is one of those things where if you don't have Robot Man in, in, as part of the cast, just kind of, you know, who's this every day? He's a NASCAR racer. He's fucking the maid. He's a shitty dad. He's, you know, he's kind of white trash. And you're like, okay, this is an average guy. This this guy is a superhero for no other reason than circumstances were out of his, out of his control, and he just sort of fell into that role, mm-hmm. you know. And so we're all kind of robot man going through the you know because y- you're dealing with an actress who thinks she's a monster and a schizophrenic and you know and and, and the Invisible Man you know and a cyborg, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like. If you t- and so if you tell that story without a point of view character, it becomes way over the top esoteric. Oh yeah, but there's always Brendan Fraser to kind of bring it back down to um, what's this guy's problem, sir? Well, <laughs> he's an alien trying to steal a necklace from a wizard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so <laughs> I just I. I'm looking through, I'm going through stills, and right here I'm looking at the one where they ended up in, oh, what was the name of this place? It was it was inside the little uh, the little snow globe. I cannot yeah. remember the name of that like, place. It was like Valhalla or something like that. It was something yeah, Nordic. It, it goes, God damn, this place and this fucking snow, and fuck, fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? <laughs> it's just over and over. It's just... <laughs> 
Uh, it's, it was it's, Nurnheim, it's, by the way. Nurnheim. There we go. Nurnheim. And man, I, okay. So yeah, just like you said, every man, NASCAR driver, uh, loses his life, thinks his daughter's dead, then finds out, of course, that she's still alive. Uh, and in the process, uh, you remember the therapy episode, like right after uh, that rat swore revenge? Admiral Whiskers, in. yes. Admiral Whiskers. People, do you understand how insane this show is? Admiral Whiskers. Admiral Whiskers and Ezekiel the Cockroach, who will make sweet, sweet love later in the uh, series. <laughs> I got to get out of the rat and make it into the roach. <laughs> so, so good. Oh, unreal. But anyway, you know. I think our biggest touching moment was, you know, you watch Cliff, Robot Man, who has, you know, he has this overprotective kind of dad thing for Crazy Jane. Yeah. Uh, and you obviously see that that's because uh, he lost his own daughter, he believes she's gone, and, and he feels a connection to her. Yeah, he uh, is way overconsumed with guilt. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's neat to kind of watch them bounce off each other because... Mm-hmm. Crazy Jane will go into a personality that was like, just don't touch me, fuck off, whatever. Hammerhead shows up, and then, uh, but, but he's the one that goes down into the underground and brings her back. Right. Uh, the underground, ladies and gentlemen, is the inside of Crazy Jane's head. But you know, Cliff goes through a lot of stuff, um, and even finds out that his daughter's still alive. Uh, <laughs> wrestles an alligator, <laughs> grabs a watch, and brings it back to her. He he is a symbol for somebody struggling to regain his humanity. Yes. That when he was flesh and bone... He can't he, feel, would... he can't eat anything, he can't... Right. I, one of the things is, he can't shit. <laughs> but that's the thing, it's like, when he was flesh and bone, he was an egocentric, um, uh, instantaneous need-driven, shit, self-centered shithead. Yep. He, he was he was as inhuman as, as one could be, and that, that's his story. When, exactly. When he had his humanity... He was inhumane. When he lost it, he went on this road. He went on this uh, journey to re- regain his humanity. And part of being a human, in, you know, we're social beings. And so he loses that connection to his daughter. He loses, you know, he is a displaced father because he's believed to be dead. Mm-hmm. And he kind of takes on a father role to Jane out of a need for that connection. Mm-hmm. That's tragic, man. That's a. It- close to tragic character because according to what we see here there's no going back uh so you know he's at some point i think during the series he's trying to kill himself uh, in in comic books there's always a way back oh yeah now comic books is a different story but (laughs) they could have easily cloned his body (laughs) actually what i find really funny about this is what a shitty robot he is (laughs) <laughs> he is too. We didn't know the only parts that move are like his elbows and his fucking knees. <laughs> like what? Like meanwhile, you have cyborg, uh-huh. you know, who's like a, who's like a living computer, and it's and it's so funny because I love the scenes of Robot Man and Cyborg together, where it's just like, I how did his brain get stuck in this walking aluminum tomato can? <laughs> But Cyborg uh, is this dynamic, you know, robot man. It's you know, it's it's so funny to me. Um, by the way, his, his their their like off the cuff sort of fourth wall breaking references to like, why don't you just email Batman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was, I can wish I could remember that one uh, where he lost. Oh, I think he forgot the keys. Like Cyborg lost the keys or something, and you know, Cliff speaks up is like, "Way to go, Aquaman." I bet Aquaman wouldn't have lost the keys. Right. Oh, so good. That's some funny stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Who's next? Um, who is next? Well, that let, let's go back to Alan Tudyk because, I mean, Timothy Dalton's fine. Yeah, okay. Timothy Dalton, if you want to talk about Timothy Dalton just real quick. Yeah, you. I mean, we get him in a few episodes. We definitely don't get him as much as the rest of the Doom Patrol. Um I mean, did you see the parallels? Remember how they mentioned how it was kind of like a parallel between the X-Men? Uh, Sheehan was talking about this, I believe. The X-Men mm-hmm. and um, Doom Patrol. Well, here you have a headmaster in a wheelchair. Uh, granted, Professor X seems a lot more, a lot more, I, I would say, genuine and uh, at least has 
better values than this guy does. But, um, you know, he's, again, searching for his daughter as well. And he gets captured by the villain of the series, Alan Tudyk's um, Nobody, Mr. Nobody, Mr. Nobody. And so that's kind of where we leave him. And then we have the the episode where he, you know, falls in love with Monkey Woman or whatever. The, <laughs> I, I that was if there was a weak episode, it was that one. But the thing is, is that that one ties into the narrative so much, it's kind of hard to say that that you can't cut the it. One that, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it's an episode that drags. Um, it did. I don't. I don't really. I didn't really find the chief to be a real compelling character until the very end, when he was basically like, "Yeah, I was part of this organization that was creating metahumans for top secret mission purposes, and then I had a daughter uh, with a monkey woman, and I needed to extend her life, and so I began causing. I, I began finding people to cause their imminent demise, and so in order to study them to see if what I did to them could save my daughter." Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you're a terrible human being. Okay, got it. <laughs> but you don't really find that out till the end. Nope. Nope. Not much else to say. He, he did find uh, there was some range of emotion every once in a while. Uh, mm. About Tim. the biggest range of emotion was when he was watching his team die over and over and over. Yeah. That was about it. <laughs> Timothy Dalton will always be Prince Baron to me. Right, go ahead and tell me the reference because I don't know. Flash Gordon, baby. Flash Gordon. Ooh, that's a deep one. Flash. For me, anyway. Uh, He'll save every one of us. Stand for every one of us. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about Alan Tudyk. Alan Tudyk has some of the best lines of this entire show. Sorry. Welcome to the shit show. I, it's like, I started watching Doom Patrol, I think, the day after my infusion, and I'm on the bed laughing hysterically. <laughs> Oh, man. Alan Tudyk as the narrator slash Mr. Nobody. Oh, perfect role. Perfect role for this guy. Uh, I want to read to you here. The, in the bus, Timothy Dalton's character, I believe this is before the black hole opens. And, you know, Alan Tudyk's going off as the narrator. And, and Timothy Dalton's character, Chief, Chief looks back at him and says, Who are you talking to? And Mr. Nobody go. He, he goes, Grant Morrison fans, Reddit trolls with DC subscriptions, and the three new fans who stuck around after the donkey fart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it, it, how do you – can you fault this guy's performance in here? I, cause I'll give it to you. you. You probably know better than I do. If you can find a fault with how he did things, you tell me. Like it's, it's so funny because Alan Tudyk has a lot of voice roles. It's like he's an, like he's an okay looking dude, but he he has such a great voice. But this was such an over the top performance, and it's so good, and it, and the show needed it because for all like the the relationship drama, mm-hmm. there needed to be at least one character who and and he has such great lines in this. Like he's talking about the you know the he's talking about he's he's talking about the show itself at one point. He's like this angst ridden meandering you know real, premium cable shit. Like, yep. I died laughing at that. I was like, okay. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of, for, you know, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking, like I said before. There's some really fun stuff in here. Like Danny the Street, that's, you know, that, that that's very creative. Um, and I love the musical aspect to that, you know, where you have Larry sort of tempted to come out and embrace his sexuality and he's like and then he's right back in the box again but you get like this extended dance sequence of like all these drag queens just running around dancing oh it's so good Mm -hmm. um it's a great song too um but then you have later on where like you know they're trying to figure out where niles is and they're like oh the key to get there is flex mentala who we need to talk about oh yes we cannot forget about flex we need to talk about flex (laughs) mentala (laughs) <laughs> um, but he literally like sends them to the white space between panels in a comic book. That's so cool. You know, there's so many abstract ideas that are put forth in this series that I never thought they would even touch. Yeah. I didn't think they would even touch Danny the Street. I was like, that is way too out there for they even for them to even attempt to try and show a viewer on TV. I was trying to tell my wife about that. I'm like, I'm like, Melissa, there's a character that's a sentient that's a sentient gender queer street. <laughs> it's the craziest fucking thing you and can she ever say. Three times was like, what do you mean by street? What's a street? Exactly. Like, like, like literally, like the thing we're driving on. 
just go crazy. Like and she couldn't that, accept that. Like, like I understand that you're speaking English, but the words don't make sense. So I had the opportunity to have my wife hop in in the middle of this season because number one, I was trying to binge through this and it just so happened. She got off work and I was like, listen, you have to watch some doom patrol with me because I have to watch some doom patrol in order to get through this before the show start uh, before the show Thursday. So we watched three episodes and I've never seen my wife so disinterested in anything that was on (laughs) screen. (laughs) And of course, again, it was in the middle of things and one of them happened to be the fucking monkey woman episode. So not a good one to start off. No, no, I'm afraid not. She's, she's not going to be invested there. Uh, But you know, for me, I think if you were able to follow this from the beginning towards the uh, all the way through to the end, you know, a, a gender queer transvestite street is you'll have a grasp that that's a potential after the first two or three episodes when you watch this. That okay, everything is all the cards are on the table. Mm-hmm. Every anything goes. It, it's anything a show goes. that truly embraces its its abstractness. It does. It does. And just starting with Mr. Nobody himself, who has some kind of – he is the narrator, but what you find out is that even as the narrator, the characters that you're watching can hear him. They they can hear I, him. I love that they play with that. Yes. That's a fun thing that they play with because at one point Rita starts narrating because she doesn't want – and it's and it's a very woke 2019 thing. She's like, I'm not going to have this man tell my story. Mm-hmm. So she starts narrating her own story, and he's like, "What the fuck?" And he's like, utterly depowered by it. Yep. But then they well, turn that around. His... Then they turn that let's... around. Yeah, they. It, it, it was great. It was great. I want to talk about his. Um, you know, let's give. A, I guess talk about his motivation because in order for people to understand him as the villain, we got to explain why. Well, what, it's, what... he's he's he kidnapped Nile for revenge. Mm-hmm. I don't. I didn't. Re- and this was part like this was early on in the season where I was kind of teetering on the fence if I was going to continue watching it or not. Outside of needing to watch it to talk about it, like it's a this this show. The pacing of the show is a little off. I have to say something negative about it. Is there's a lot of world building that has to happen. There's a lot of um, you know setting of themes and everything. And so the show kind of takes a while to get started. Mm-hmm. And then such weird crap happens. You're like, wait, did the whole street just go up a donkey's ass? Oh, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, when that donkey hacks up Crazy Jane, you're like, okay, did not see that coming. And the rest of the series, you're going to be saying that. Oh, I did not see that coming. Until you get to the very end when you see a lot of people. Oh, wait a second. We'll talk about Flex Mentalo here in a few. Um, but uh, you didn't get that joke. That'll that'll <laughs> come around, Mark. That'll come around here in a few. Um, so, uh, yeah. Also, the other thing is that he's like a dejected villain. He was. Do you remember that episode where? Yeah, he, goes, he got kicked out of the Brotherhood of Evil. <laughs> and he's like trying to impress this girl, and uh, which I don't know if it's his wife or his fiance at the time, and she's having none of it. She's like, yeah. "Well, you go right back in there and march right back in there and tell Mister Mind or whatever, whoever the hell his the lead uh, the lead guy of the Brotherhood of Evil." tell him you want your job back he's like that's not exactly how this works <laughs> he's like i'm lucky to be out of there alive so yeah she anyway. basically she basically like just neuters him at the at the table and he you know and so a lot of this is him trying to prove himself and they use that against him but yeah there's, there's something between him and niles where uh niles somehow wronged him in, in another life and this is revenge mm-hmm. it was pretty simple and- after that it's just sort of all over the place He's a damn powerful character. I mean, to be a narrator, controlling everything that's going on in all these people's lives, it's very powerful. And Alan Tudyk is, like, the most... He can portray this villain like he should be. I mean, over the top, uh, the laughter and the monologues, great stuff. So let's talk about Flex Mentalo and (laughs) him causing a mass orgasm on Danny the Street. (laughs) Like I said, we come around to it, Mark. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the guy playing him, D- Devon Chandler Long, uh, I thought he did a. You know, I don't think he, I, there's no link to a Wikipedia page on him, so I don't think he's been in a lot of things. But he, uh, I thought he did a really great job as Flex Mentalo. I thought the use of Flex Mentalo as sort of this 
like gatekeeper to another dimension and all of that and you know him i i it, it's a funny concept and they don't overuse it they use it just enough to make it funny and interesting oh. He's such a wholesome dude, too. Mm -hmm. Like, he, you know, he, he's walking out there. You see the flashback to the 60s where he's walking out there with his wife. And he's in <laughs> the Leopard Speedo or whatever it is. <laughs> yes. And it's just like, he's just walking down. No problem. Everybody's like, hey, it's Flex Mentallo. And then, you know, some kid's cat gets stuck up a tree. And all he has to do is flex a muscle and the tree bends down. Which is, I, cr as far as crazy superpowers go, I don't know if that's like, if that's kind of... Uh, a one or a ten in this show, I have no idea. But uh, regardless, yeah, it, it, he was so wholesome. You know, all he wants to do is watch his soap operas. Lost his memory, uh, and they're trying to. They understand that he holds the key to try and get to no, Mister Nobody, but they've got to get his memory back. And they find him at the ant farm, and um, you know, a really, really powerful character who uh, ends up being an amnesiac. They help him get his powers back, and then of course he helps them get to Mr. Nobody. But yeah, top moment of the show, of the whole season, is when Flex is trying to get them to the white between the panels. And he flexes the wrong muscle. The entire town has a mass orgasm set to the song <laughs> All a, By Myself. This wholesome dude who's watching everybody just lose their shit around him, <laughs> and he looks like he's just mortified, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, 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 I did oh, a I bad, did I did a bad thing. I flexed the wrong muscle. And but well, the best part of that though is a uh, robot man faking an orgasm because he didn't want to oh, be left out. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Great stuff. Oh, All right. Perfect. So one last character I want to talk about, and I think we can start to wrap up here. Uh, Tommy Snyder. Beard hunter. Yes. Beard as, hunter. as Ernest Franklin, the beard hunter. First of all, the first time he, mm, the first time uh, no, he eats the, the beard toilet. hair. Get to the bathroom. <laughs> First time he eats the beard hair, I almost threw up. Drain scum is what Mur they called it. <laughs> I knew, I knew as soon as I saw that, I was like, Mark is not going to like this at I all. I had to avert my eyes. I couldn't do it. Oh, and it's just like a close up and you just, I mean, they pulled no punches. It's not like they turned the camera away. No. No, you watch this man. And it's just like, I can't believe what I'm watching right yeah, now. Oh, is... but it gets better. You see a cockroach and a, a rat make out later, so. Less disturbing I guess. than him eating the... Okay. <laughs> mm. Anyway, the actor is really funny. The stuff with the Beard Hunter, I thought was very funny and very out there and very Doom Patrolish. so I just wanted to give him a quick mention. Uh, overall, so so the, show, the series ends with a... They rescue Niles. Um, they... Uh, they end up having to team with Mr. Nobody against Admiral Whiskers and Ezekiel the Cockroach. <laughs> Who betray Mr. Nobody. Uh, I can but... tell you that the last, the last, the second to last episode I really liked, mm -hmm. and then when the last episode hit, it felt like a whirlwind. I mean, there it felt like that should have been another episode or two for me to kind of get a grasp on it. There's just so much shit happening. Yeah. All of a sudden they're teaming with them, and I was like, okay, well, all right, I mean, it's Doom Patrol. What, what what do I expect? It's going to be insanity. So uh, it ends with a cliffhanger ending of Danny the Street becoming Danny the Brick and everybody but I think one character having been shrunk to Admiral Whisker size. Yeah, Larry Trainer I think, was the one that made it out um, okay. Yeah. The one that was still regular size after all that. So that's all well and good. And they, res and they rescue um, Man-Ape's daughter, uh, <laughs> Dorothy Spinner. Dorothy Spinner, so, the eight piece girl. Yes, so there's um, there's plenty of grist for the mill for a second season if they are allotted one by Warner Brothers. My favorite episode. Let, let's uh, last thing, and then we're going to wrap up. My favorite episode was Cyborg Patrol. It was the yeah. one episode where I had to stop watching because it was like dinner time or whatever, but I had to know what happened next, and there was mm -hmm. no other episode where I cared. Okay, where, there was no other episode where where it was like. There were definitely times where I needed to take a break from the show. I needed to kind of walk away, do something else, watch something else. Just like, okay, I, I, I've had enough of this for a little while. I, you know, and, and I feel like that's like, well, I, I, I'm sending mixed messages because it's a very well-written show. It's an extremely well-acted show, but it's a bit much at times. And, I, and this is not one of those things where, you know, I think like, I want to say like Glow, I watched all in one night. 
and like every episode is like, what happens next? What happens next? You know, this episode, like Flash, uh, I don't binge. I watch as it comes out live. And that's one where like I can't wait to see the next episode usually. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, like I'm really anxious to see what's going to happen next. With this one, and I was like, uh, three episodes was about my limit. I had to, okay. you know, so I broke this up into like chunks of three or four episodes at a time. Cyborg Patrol was the only one where like I wanted to know what was the like. Did he really kill his dad or didn't he? And I had yeah. to go to the Wikipedia page just be, just to get through dinner. Oh wow, <laughs> it was that bad. I was I was really worried. I was like, man, if he killed his dad, that is some fucked up stuff. He is going to mm-hmm. have to live with that. That character is going to be broken for a while. Yeah, and yeah, we find out that it's not the case. Thank goodness. But whew, what a thing to live on. So, um, what was your favorite episode? I'm trying to think of – I think my favorite one was the two-parter where they w- go to find the actual Doom Patrol. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if it was a two-parter or a one-parter. But either way, they go to find this uh, this old team, uh, which was the Doom Patrol, and they walk into this school, and everybody is – you know, uh, their students there. They're giving Crazy Jane a hard time, and she's trying to – you know, they're just basically trying to find some clues. I think Mr. Nobody led them there. Uh Yes, that was uh, wh- so that Jane would lose faith and not try to find Niles. Yeah, and then as things progress, you find out that you know this school's been shut down, and the the people that were supposedly leading the school, which were former members of the Doom Patrol, who you thought were successful heroes, were not. As a matter of fact, they lost their first battle against Mister Nobody, and from that point on, they had been just left in this decrepit state and uh i I wish i could remember the name of the the guy from the doom patrol that had the mind powers but either way you know he was he was they were projecting this image to keep them kind of in a state where they were comfortable because they were left in a state of agony afterwards steve dayton otherwise known as mento mento (laughs) that's a weird name all i could think of was the fresh maker yes so (laughs) But yeah, you know, you see them, you're like, oh, you, Rita ends up running into him. But you know what I figured out immediately? I, I was like, something's wrong here because Mento is not like 70 years old. Why isn't he 70 years old? And then, of course, we find out that, you know, it's a projection and he's actually 70 in a wheelchair and a, basically almost a vegetable. Um, pretty sad, but I think it was it was a fun episode because they they – they have to deal with a lot. Uh, mm. So there you go. There's there's my favorite um, my favorite episodes. All right, uh, my second favorite episode episode was definitely Jane Patrol. Yeah, you liked that dive deep into the psychosis of Crazy yeah. Jane, which was fun to see all, and I mean all of her personalities at yes. one point. If I, if I could just make a, a public service announcement, please stop, don't fuck your children. <laughs> this is the result. It's a terrible thing. You will cause schizophrenia. Please don't have sex with your children. Come here, sweetie baby. Come here. Was that what he kept saying over and over? I'm like, oh, man, baby K. Un- Come here, baby K. Uncomfortable. Yes. I'm Un- really glad they didn't make that like graphic or anything. Like it's so, just like they they achieved an appropriate level of creepiness with just him standing in the doorway. Before we close. Before we close, I have a question for you because we usually talk about these things, uh, especially with movies. Are they going to bring in people to want to read the comic? If you were to watch, sit down and watch Doom Patrol like you did, I mean, does this kind of spur you to like, oh, maybe I will pick up a, a, a the Doom show, Patrol comic? The show alone, no. The okay. show in conjunction with Sheehan explaining the Grant Morrison run, I want to read the Grant Morrison run. Yeah, yeah, I'm right there with you. Now I want to find time to uh, grab a hold of the Grant Morrison run and start with, start with that at some point. Yeah, maybe so maybe two. I'll, yeah, I was going to say maybe if they announce a season 2, we'll save it for that. And uh, you know, even though I shied away from it because I didn't think, you know, anything written before 1990 we were going to really enjoy, maybe we'll take a chance on it. We'll t- take on me, Jesse. Hey. Grant Morrison, I think, has been around. So this is the '80s, late mm-hmm. '80s, I think '90s. So I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to hurt if we read that. I think it'll be fine. All yeah. right, um, so that's that. That's our take on Doom Patrol tonight. Uh, highly recommend it. You know, for people who, if you're, if you if you're like a Twin Peaks kind of person, you know, Dark Highway. Uh, you know, you enjoy the abstract, the esoteric. If you're willing to give something a try and not be uh, prejudice against something that the source material is a comic book. 
I don't think I don't think you can miss with Doom Patrol. It's it's extremely well done. I agree. I agree. It's yeah. it's a great representation of what we got on the pages to the screen, uh, and uh, you'll have a good time. I mean, if you like wacky, weird, fun stuff, this this is right up your alley. All right. Uh, so this past week, we uh, we talked. We referenced it already. We talked about the Doom Patrol comic from 2016, I believe it was. Or, yeah, 2016. Yep, Gerard Way, the lead singer of Chemi- My Chemical Romance. Yes, this was the Magnificent Seven of of, of, of uh, DC Comics. <laughs> Akira Kurosawa, is that Some, what it was? Something like that, yeah. Did I remember that? Okay, all right. Um, so we did a Damn You Hollywood for Crawl. We reviewed the Texas Hippie Coalition, where Jesse and I got into a sissy slap fight over it. Um, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. <laughs> uh, Comic-Con's going on right now. Uh-oh. So Monday, in addition to uh, Jesse and I reviewing a Cloak and Dagger comic, you'll also get a full panel of Rattle and Broadcasting All-Stars running down a uh, list of a list watch-along of all the trailers that have come out throughout Comic-Con weekend, such as Top Gun Maverick and Cat, which I'm all in on. Um, nice. <laughs> can't wait for Cats. Uh, the new It trailer, so Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Whatever else we got, you know, that comes out between now and the end of Comic Con, uh, we'll do a watch along. We'll uh, for all of those trailers, and that'll go up sometime Monday night, along with our source material on Cloak and Dagger. Um, we'll have a Lion King review, Sabaton, The Great War, and Jesse and I are back for yet another weird ass show. What do you think of Cloak and Dagger season two so far? Weird than season am... one, right? Yeah, I'm at I am at C or episode, excuse me episode four. Uh, so she just went into the she's she went into cloak and she just came back out. So mm. that's where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, wait it's till you, weird. Wait till I, you get I, to the endless what if episode. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of endless what ifs, uh, we reviewed AEW and Evolve's tenth anniversary show. We reviewed Extreme Rules. Those are up in the archives. This weekend is uh, some boxing. Uh, the undercard of Pacquiao Thurman, uh, which is Plant versus Lee, will be on Fox. And Pat and I will do live coverage of that. Okay. Very good. Uh, hey, keep an ear out, ladies and gentlemen. Me and Chris Armstrong are doing a little something for the Unspoken Decade that's getting hosted right here on the Rattlich in the Broadcasting Network. Uh, we are going to be dropping what we're going to consider the, the title of said series is going to be Unspoken Issues. That's what we're deciding to roll with uh, to tie in with the greatest 90s comic book website out there, The Unspoken Decade. And our zero issue of said podcast will be dropping most likely next week. So if, uh, it's another comic book podcast, probably going to be bi weekly. If you're into comics, uh, give it a listen there, especially 90s comics. Me and Chris are going to be taking a look at just a single issue and giving you about a half hour, 45 minutes of our thoughts, fun facts, all sorts of great stuff there. So keep an ear out for that. And, uh, yeah, as Mark said, do source material. It's a weekly show here on the old network where we talk comic book story arcs and our thoughts on them after we read them. All kinds uh, of ill shit. Oh, yes. All kinds of ill shit. we got the ill communication. Just like, uh, what's her name from Punisher? Ma Nucci. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Ma Nucci. That celestial and... being. All right. <laughs> now let's get out of here, Mark. Uh, give it to me. Give me the canned plug. Remember, tell people about that pod coin. Oh, oh yeah, that's shit. Right. Give me some that's pod right. coin. Ladies and gentlemen, go give the Rattlich in Broadcasting Network Facebook page a like to stay up on top of all the great podcasts that we have to offer. You can find us on just about any platform, but if you're going to choose one, I would suggest you choose Podcoin. Not just because we want you to. No, ladies and gentlemen, you can get paid for listening to podcasts and that is by using the app podcoin give it a give it a little look see check it out see what you think it might be something you're interested in i know i listen to podcasts a lot most likely if you're listening to this show right now you probably do too why not get paid to do it were you why not? have you been able to find all the podcasts you listen to on podcoin because i found almost all of my all the ones i listen to on podcoin i think just about every single one of them are on there it's an aggregator that grabs everything they can so uh, you, you should have no problems finding what you can on there, uh, what you want to look for. So, uh, but yeah, with that being said, Mark Radlich, I'm ready to go. All right, folks, thanks for joining us here on this TV party tonight. 
our review of Doom Patrol for Jesse Starcher, The Disapproving Dead. Be well, be safe, and behave.